Hey guys, today we're going to be going over some basics about writing. And everything that I'm going to say in this little video lecture can also be found in the writing documents I uploaded to Blackboard. Right? You can find those along with everything else in course content and writing documents. And there you'll see uh, the overview and instructions for the paper. You'll see something called philosophical writing in general. You'll see a grading rubric, and you will see student writing samples. And if you kind of combine all of that into one, this is what you're going to get today in the video. So, um, in general, I always say that when it comes to writing for philosophy, there are three general qualities that you want to be aware of. Okay, so the first quality is something that sounds basic, but maybe isn't actually so basic. And this is explanation. So obviously, um, philosophers are very concerned with definitions, and it's no different when we're talking about writing. So in order to know what this means, we have to kind of understand what an explanation is. You have to explain explanation, so to speak. So the way I've explained explanation on one of the sheets is to say that an explanation is a descriptive analysis um, whereby one person breaks down a concept or issue into simpler language so that someone else can understand. So you get this thing that's worded in a specific way and that's quite complex, and then you break it down into precise, clear, concise language, and this helps your reader understand. Right? And when I say descriptive analysis, I mean, in some sense, you are describing the idea or argument, right? Like, what is the case, right? What is being said? So you want to explain things, and you want to do it clearly. And I outlined on the sheet uh, a couple of things uh, that explanation does is a it provides your reader right the explainee with a clear understanding of the issue remember your reader does not know about any of these stuff they're intelligent in the sense that they're capable of understanding everything that you give them but you can't assume that they have any prior knowledge or a philosophy expert or live in your head and know what you're talking about right so that's the one point of explanation the second point uh, is that when you explain something, you're showing me the extent to which you understand the material. Um, because if you explain something really well, this means that you really understand the mechanics of it and like you've broken down everything in your head and you're able to order everything linguistically and it's like, okay, good job. So you want to explain, but you don't only want to explain because if you just explain, that would be what? A summary. And a philosophy paper is not merely a summary, although some aspect of summary is involved in the greater process. So you want to explain, but after you explain, you have to do something else, right? After you explain what the issue is, you have to say something about the issue, right? You have to, have to say something about the thing or things that you explain. And the thing you ha say have to be substantive, right? It has to be adding something to what's not already there in the text. And you must make a claim, in other words, and argue for this claim with reason. And this is where the second quality comes into play. Philosophy is all about the argument. And this is something that I've been trying to hammer um, in all of our lecture videos and since day one, but I can't emphasize it enough. If you're wondering how to approach a philosophy text or how to write philosophy yourself, you should be thinking in terms of argument, right? What is the claim being made? What is the evidence being presented for the claim, right? So an argument in philosophy has a more specific definition than an argument in everyday life has. Because usually when we hear this word argument, we're accustomed to thinking it's something like 
uh, this shouting match, right? Oh, they had an argument. They had a disagreement. And that's not quite what an argument is in academic language. So an argument in logic, in philosophy, is something very specific. Uh, we say that it is, first and foremost, a set of claims containing uh, a main claim. But really, this is another way of saying a conclusion. and at least one support claim, which we call premises. Okay, so that's what's involved in an argument. First and foremost, what is a claim? Well, a claim is any declarative sentence, right? It's any kind of utterance so something you say or something you write down um, that's capable of being true or false. So if I were to tell you this marker is on top of my hand right now, that's a claim because it is capable of being true or false and it happens to be true. But if I said the marker is on top of the chair right now, that's false, right? But it's still a claim because it's capable of being false or true. What's not a claim? Questions. I said, hey, what's your favorite color? Not a claim, not declaring anything, it can't be true or false. Or if I punch the board and say, ow, ow is an utterance, but ow is not a claim. Or if you give someone a command like, hey, stop doing that, not a claim, right? They can't be true or false. Claims are statements, they are things that can be true or false. So an argument needs at least two claims, at the very least. Just one claim, not an argument. You need your conclusion. And the conclusion is the main claim towards which everything else in the argument points. However, you need to give evidence for your conclusion, right? One claim by itself is an argument, you need to give support. And that's where the premises come in. So for example, if I were to tell you it's sunny outside right now, that's not an argument. It's just a claim. Let's say it's my conclusion. How do I support that claim? Well, I say something like, hmm, premise one, I'm looking outside, and I can see that it's sunny, right? Premise two, I know that my senses aren't deceiving me right now. Therefore, it is, rain, uh, it is sunny outside, right? So you see there's a, a network of premises that are attempting to support that conclusion. So you need multiple claims. So you're going to be doing this in your paper. And all philosophers are doing this when they write. So whenever you're analyzing a text and you're not quite sure how to understand it, try and break it into an argumentative form. Try to figure out, like, okay, what is their conclusion? What are they trying to say? And what support are they giving for it? That's what you should be looking for. And that's what you should be doing when you're presenting your own stuff. Okay? Um, let's see. So... The thing about argument you have to keep in mind is that you need reason, right? Like you need rational justification for what you're saying. You can't just say something like, this is right. Why? Well, because I think it's right. Why? Well, because I think the alternative is wrong. You're not saying anything, right? You're just repeating your claim and then going in a circle. So you don't want that. An argument requires that you justify your position. It's like, why are you saying the thing that you're saying? How do you know that this is the case? How do you know that the other thing is not the case? So after you explain something, then you want to present an argument. And the purpose of argument, as I say in the sheet, is at least fourfold, right? One, argument demonstrates that you're actually engaged with the issue. Because to be able to say something legitimate about something, you have to be focused, right? You have to be in there. You can't BS this. That's the one great thing about philosophy papers, right? Uh, if you try to do that, it's going to show. It's like not something you could hide. At the end of the day, I'm asking you to present your case for something. So the paper is 100% you presenting your thoughts. 
Now, you can't hide behind your thoughts and fake it, right? It would be like if I said, uh, here's a basketball, go play basketball against uh, LeBron James, and you've never played basketball, but you're like, I think I could BS my way through this. No, you can't, right? As soon as you try to dribble, it's going to show. So you really want to be engaged with the issue in order to make an effective argument. Um, two, arguments show that you're capable of thinking in abstractions. It lets me know that you're able to go beyond the immediate, right? You're not just talking about one object or one instance of something or one random idea. It's like you're able to draw back, right, into the realm of thoughts and understand concepts in general and relations between concepts in general, right? That's what it's about. Three, um, when you argue, you show that your thought process is clear and consistent. Absolutely necessary. So clarity is actually going to be the next thing we talk about. But before we get to that, you need to make, first of all, you need to have stuff happening right up here. There needs to be content in, in your mind. And a lot of the times the content in our minds is jumbled. Like it's not well thought out. It's kind of fragments of fragments of ideas and like half ideas. And there's no order to it. So what an argument forces you to do is take that mess and to sort it, right? And this forces you to really think about stuff. It's like, okay, so what exactly is this thing? How exactly does this thing relate to this thing? How exactly do those things relate to this general principle? And you're structuring things really, really nicely. Okay, so you want to create order in your mind, and this order is going to allow you to make an argument. And the fourth thing I have here is that you're giving rational credibility to your position, right? It's like, I don't just believe you. Someone's not just going to take you at face. You have to give us reasons why we should believe your position as opposed to another position, right? You got to have a reason. If you don't have a reason, you kind of don't have a position. You just have vague thoughts. And you certainly don't want to do the thing where you say, no, 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 I'm not listening to anything but me. Not something you should be doing as an adult, right? Um, keep in mind, your argument should be framed as a response to something that's been said. For the history of philosophy, one big conversation. That's all it is. I say that like it's a simple thing, but that's all it is. It's been happening for over 2,000 years. Someone says this, someone steps in and says, hey, but what about this? Someone steps in a few years later, I don't know, maybe there's this alternative. Someone steps back in, I don't know, that first person had it right. It's just one big conversation. You've been in conversations before. They require you to understand what's going on and formulate a response that's relevant to those things, right? So you are now walking into this 2,000 year long philosophical conversation. That's what you should view this paper as, right? And I can't stress enough, merely repeating a claim over and over again, not an argument, not an argument. Okay. So your argument is going to come to fruition in the form of something that we call a thesis. Now this is a word that you may have heard before, if you're not quite familiar with what it is, maybe it sounds intimidating, um, don't let it get to you. So as I point out in the overview and instructions document, your thesis is going to involve you explaining and responding to something in the text. And your thesis is going to be that conclusion, that main claim towards which the rest of your paper points. Now the thing about your thesis is that it should be explicitly stated unambiguously, right, and contextualized in your introduction paragraph. Now, for more info on how to write a good introduction paragraph, check out that uh, writing an introduction document I uploaded. Now, in order for your thesis to be legitimate, it must be something beyond the obvious. In other words, you can't say, uh, in this paper, I will argue that cups are different from markers. That's indisputable, right? Your argument has to be A, 
arguable, right? Like in theory, it must be possible for someone to disagree with it. It has to be challengeable. And B, your thesis should be ampliative. In other words, it needs to go beyond the pool or seek to go beyond the pool of what is already known, not just repeat something, right? Again, not just summarizing or saying the same thing that a certain philosopher said. Now, really quick, I want to go over these non-theses that I put on the, the sheet because this is important. Now, there are some roads that students often choose just because it's like a default you land on without thinking about something too hard and it seems easy. The problem is these defaults are not actually meeting the criteria for what a thesis is. So here's an example of two common things people think are theses but actually aren't. Example one, I have person A say said X, right? Person A said X. In other words, this person said this thing. That's not a thesis. You're just summarizing. You're just telling me that someone said a thing, right? Now, unless you plan on, as I say, toppling over some conventional understanding in academia of this thing that someone says, you're going to want to avoid stating that as your thesis. The thesis is not in the fact that someone said something. Rather, it lies in the fact that now you are going to say something about the fact that someone said this thing, right? So you will have to talk about what someone said, right? You will have to state and explain, but you don't only do that. That's not an argument. Okay, here's another similar non-thesis. Oh, yeah, there's children screaming in the background. Sorry about that. Um, person A said X. But person B said Y. Also not a thesis. Now you're just telling me this person says a thing, and then now this person says a different thing. So what? Right? We know that. That's, that's a starting point. What about the fact that this one says this, but this one says that? What about that difference? Right? You actually need to say something substantive. You should always, as a piece of advice, ask yourself, so what? when you're writing something to make sure you have this clear goal in mind and that you're working towards that clear goal. Okay. Um, now in terms of like, what is my thesis? What am I arguing about? That's up to you. That's up to you. There's not a specific prompt. The topic, the issue is completely up to you. The goal is you analyze and evaluate something that's going on in one of the texts and then make an argument about it rationally and that's it. You could choose anything, any idea, any sub-idea, any argument within one or more of the texts that we looked at and then make an argument about it, right? Now, you guys are sometimes overwhelmed because you're like, but tell me what to write about, right? And that's not the point, right? This is something you're going to have to get over. Um, coming, I said to say in the paper, I think it's important, coming up with your own ideas is difficult. But it's something that's necessary for intellectual growth. And it's not something I could do for you, right? I can't tell you what your own idea is. I can't tell you what to write. I can only tell you some general framework about how to write effectively. So... A good place to start, I always say, is by going back to the texts, right? Rereading stuff, rewatching the lecture videos, right? And you find something that sticks out to you. I said this could be something you think is interesting, something that you think wasn't argued for in the most effective way, um, something you want to challenge, something you want to expand upon uh, substantially, something you want to draw a connection between this and this thing. It's up to you, right? Just start going back to the texts and like having all this run through your mind and open a junk notes tab. Just start writing stuff down. Like don't worry about if it's good or not. Just get your ideas out. Like all right, so this is this, but what about this? Maybe I want to ask about this, but I'm not sure about this. This reminds me of this other idea. Just get your notes on the paper. You could organize it later. It's fine, right? Um, spill your thoughts to find exactly where you stand. This is super, super personal. Um, the part where you say your thing, right? The part where you 
talking about what someone else is saying is, is not personal, right? There's objective criteria for judging whether or not you've explained it well, but when it comes to presenting your own ideas, this should be an honest thing, right? You should be open with yourself. You should be honestly introspecting, right? Don't write, this is the key, do not write what you think that I want you to write. You should really be exploring what's going on in here authentically, okay? Um, and remember, the paper is a response. If you look at the tips uh, section on the, the second page of the overview, you'll see this same stuff. You should open, this means you should always start with the text, then look for connections and ask questions and have ideas. Don't randomly think of some idea, like, I have this idea, right? And then cherry pick the text to try and make some kind of connection and force it. It's not gonna work. And if it kind of works, it's not gonna work well. And again, this is something you can notice. I say this is like joining a conversation and talking loudly without knowing what everyone else said. All right, you don't wanna be that person. Um, you always want to write a lot about a little bit. You don't want to write a little bit about a lot. You don't want to skim 10 things. You want to write a lot about one or two things. Well, one thing, right? With different aspects. I have to say this because there's, there's always more than you think than there is to say about something. Always more. Um, oftentimes we think like, I explained it fully, but you didn't. The reason you think that is when you look at the text, right? When you look at the stuff you wrote down, you're looking at two sentences. And to you, that means those two sentences and all of your associated thoughts about those two sentences. But what if I told you literally all this stuff, no one else has access to except you. So it's your job to give that to the reader, which means not only writing two sentences, it's like spilling out everything to effectively convey the idea. Um, I highly recommend writing about only one text. There's so much to say, right? You could, in theory, write about two texts if you want to like write about the relationship between ideas or something like that, but if you do that, make sure you're you're going a little bit longer on your paper, right? It's a five page minimum. Make sure it's a little bit longer, maybe six, maybe seven if you do that to ensure that you're really capturing both texts, but it's five page minimum. Um, do not write about more than two texts. Do not do three or more or seven or 15, like do not do that. It's tempting because then you're like, I have to write less. No, if that's what you're thinking, you're already approaching it wrong and it's gonna stand out. I could tell if you wrote one sentence about 15 things. So really stick with an idea or a couple ideas within one text or compare an idea or two from two texts. Don't try to do more than that. You can't do that much in five pages, right? There's like whole books on one idea. So there's no way you could do that. So some of you may be wondering, oh, do I use secondary sources? Do I use outside sources? You could, if you want. Um, you don't have to, that's up to you. In theory, you could. However, if you do that, it can't affect negatively your analysis of the primary text. And it can't become a substitute for your own position or overshadow your own position. And don't use it to just fill space. So I would say, no, you don't have to use an outside source. Don't go out of your way to do it. But if you're like dying to do it because you see some interesting connection you want to work out, go for it, but make sure you're doing it effectively. Another requirement, uh, direct textual analysis is a must, meaning you have to quote stuff from the text and cite it and talk about it. If you don't make direct references to the text, like if you don't use any passages, then you can't pass the paper. And if conversely your paper is only quotations, also, you're probably not gonna pass the paper because you're just filling space. So now you might be wondering, wait, but what's the minimum amount? However much you, you need, right? I say on the paper, um, engage in exactly as much direct textual analysis as is necessary for you to make your point. No more, no less. So I can't tell you what that is. Minimum would be you have to at least use a couple, like one or two, but it's as many as you need. 
right? Don't think of it in terms of this choppy formula. Um, similarly, there's not a minimum amount of scholarly sources, right? This isn't really how people write for these kinds of things. This is kind of a weird formula you've done in other classes just to get you to survey what other people have said. This is not about that. You're only using one source or two sources. So it's not about bringing what other people said about Kant or Mill or Aristotle. It's about you evaluating these ideas, right? You are trying to be the scholar right now. So in terms of the format, five pages minimum, right? Five pages the minimum, meaning if you submit less than five pages, then you lose points automatically, right? Four and a half pages, not five. Four and three quarters, not five. You need at least five pages. If you're writing less than five pages, you're showing me that you don't care, right? You're showing me that you didn't try hard enough and that you're trying to just get this thing over with. It's not going to be a good paper. Um, in terms of the other stuff, oh, and by the way, your title page, that's not a page. And your references page, that's not a page. It's five pages of actual paper. The, uh, the paper should be double spaced, standard 12 point Times New Roman font, and one inch margins. That's all regular. I can see if you don't do that. And in terms of format, the paper should be in Chicago. Now, maybe you've done that, maybe you haven't. It's not complicated, I promise. Don't feel overwhelmed. It's super easy. Um, you're going to want to Google Owl Purdue Chicago. Google that, and you'll be brought to a page with all the necessary information, and I could post the link too in Blackboard if that's easier. Um, the main things you need to know about Chicago is that when you um, cite things, instead of doing parenthetical citation, you use a footnote. And that's basically it. That's the main thing you want to focus on. There's other little rules, but the main thing is uh, you need a title page, references page of a certain way, and uh, your footnotes, right? So footnotes are easy. If you use Apple Pages, you just click Insert Footnote and it'll automatically shoot you down to the bottom of the page with a number. You write the author's name, the work, the page number. In Microsoft Word, it's something very similar. You just go into the formatting options and insert a footnote. You could also Google how to insert footnote in Word, and it'll come right there. Don't use, please, please, please do not use Google Docs. It doesn't work well for this kind of thing. It's not gonna let you do footnotes in the right way. I've had tons of problems with Google Docs and students. Um, after you've made your case, you want to consider at least one objection to your argument. What could someone say against the thing that you're saying? That's the objection. And you do this in order to show that you're thinking ahead. You're prepared to give responses. You're actually engaged and you care about ideas other than your own. It shows you're really, really doing something scholarly. Now, after you consider the objection, you then need to consider a counter argument. And the counter argument is your response to the objection, right? How would you argue against their argument? Why do you think your original thesis still stands in the face of that objection? So you got to do at least one of those. You can do more if you want. And it also allows uh, you to identify potential weaknesses in your own argument. For more information, I would say check out the paper rubric that has everything you need to know. It's like, here's what an A is, here's what a C is, here's what an F is. Specifics, please, please, please look at the paper rubric that is going to help you. If you're not doing that, you're setting yourself up for disaster. And then I say for more specifics on how to approach the writing process, look at the four documents I uploaded. One's called Philosophical Writing in General, and that's going over the, the qualities we're talking about. You know, about to give your third quality. The second one's writing an introduction. The third one is the paper grading rubric. And the fourth one, student writing samples. This is going to give you concrete, like real student papers from the past. This is what it looks like. And I give commentary on like each paragraph, right? Here's what's good about it. Here's what's not good about it. Here's what they could do differently. Paragraph by paragraph. And then I give you this paper received a C. This paper received an A. And then I explain it. So you're really seeing examples of like actual theses 
intro paragraphs, actual everything, right? So that should help. Please look at that. Okay. Last quality I want to talk about before we wrap it up. Clarity. My favorite one. My favorite, favorite, favorite one. I can't stress this one enough. Right? Please look at what I wrote about this on the philosophical writing in general document. I say vagueness is not a virtue. Whether you're presenting your own ideas or someone else's ideas, you have to be precise. If you're not precise about someone else, A, you're showing that you don't understand the issue, and B, at worst, you're engaging in a straw man argument, which means you're misrepresenting their argument, which means your argument is invalid or you're responding something to something they didn't actually say. So, and the other thing I say is the reader doesn't, again, the reader doesn't have access to that movie playing inside your head. You know how when you're thinking about stuff and looking at stuff and writing, there's like all this action happening? No one, literally it's impossible for someone else to get there. I don't see that stuff when, I, when I'm looking at your paper. All I see is the words. So you really have to make sure that the words on the page are accurately painting that, that thing going on in your mind, right? It's not like we're computers where I just plug into your mind and, oh, I have your idea. We have language. That's all we have. And language is super imprecise, which is why you have to be extremely clear. Meaning is only there to the extent that that linguistic precision is there. So really, really, really focus on that, I would say. That's something I look for a lot. And similarly, it's because there's this undeniable uh, tie between language and thought. We usually say things like, oh, I get it, but I don't know how to explain it. And actually, that's, that's not really true most of the time. If you understand something but can't explain it, in all likelihood, that means you don't actually understand it. Be and it means that you don't know how to put order to the thoughts in your head and you don't have the systematic structure. So using language forces you to do that. To linguize something is to conceptualize it clearly. So if you struggle, it's because you're not conceptualizing it clearly. Um, which I can help you with. Sign up for office hours, right? I have those office hour sign-up sheets on, on Blackboard and not enough students sign up for this. So if you're having trouble understanding the texts, if you have trouble like at a point in your paper or anything like that, you can contact me by email or office hours and I will try to help the best I can. Um, the paper due date is on the syllabus as is other information. And just to say it explicitly here, um, this first paper is due Monday, October 12th. So this is a setting assigned to you on the 5th. It's due on the 12th. So you have a week to flesh out a five page paper. Um, that should be enough time. Email me as much as you want. Come to my office hours. Um, please reach out if you're struggling. I can't emphasize that enough. I'm here to help. I have all this literature for you guys to look at to help you in the writing process and I hope this video has been helpful. So keep that in mind uh, and you want to consider all these questions when you're writing. Like what exactly did the author say? What does the author mean? Why did she say it? How might the author respond to this hypothetical scenario? How might I respond to what the author said? What is my own position? How do I argue for my own position? Are there exceptions to what I'm saying? All this stuff is on the sheets I want you to look at. Um, so that is basically it. This is just a supplement to those documents I gave you. So please check those out. And if you're still having issues, um, let me know. And I will try to help you as much as I can. And that's about it. So good luck, guys. I wish you the best. Um, yeah, have a good rest of the week. I will see you around.